So why is it that when we look around us, most of the world looks green? There's all this juicy material out there, resources, food, for potential organisms that could take advantage of it. And yet when we look around, most of the world it still has its green tissues. Whether we're talking about coniferous forests or grasslands or deserts, it pretty much still remains that most of the biomass is there. And this is despite the fact that, as we've already learned in this class, insects have a variety of ways of chomping on that plant tissue, either as leaf miners or stem borers or gallers. They've evolved all sorts of ways to take advantage of those plants. So why is it that for the most part, the world is green? In a seminal paper in 1960, Hurston, Smith, and Slobodkin tried to propose some ideas as to why this uh, was actually the case. And in this essay that they wrote, they basically um, gave some examples of situations where the world actually wasn't the green, where there were instances where there was defoliation uh, and uh, overconsumption, you might say, of the plant material that was in a particular community. And they categorized them into the following um, examples. They said, often when we see this kind of uh, defoliation happening, it's in the case of species being introduced into an area where they're not uh, native to. For example, the gypsy moth uh, here. This was a species that was introduced into North America uh, in the uh, late 1800s to try to start a uh, domestic uh, silk industry. There's so many things wrong with this, I can't even start. Um, uh, but the short of it is that the moths got out and slowly they've been marching across the, the US from, uh, from Massachusetts. Uh, the, the invasion front went through Wisconsin in the early 2000s and they're still kind of moving out. And where they go through, you actually see these areas of complete defoliation where the trees are, com are stripped clean uh, of every leaf that they have. And it's the caterpillars that are, that are doing most of this. Uh, the females are actually wingless and that's why this invasion front has taken a long time. And as we learned from our example in the very beginning of the class, this uh, has to do with, uh, that part of the reason for this has to do with the fact that there are no uh, nat native predators that can actually utilize these, uh, these herbivores very, uh, very well. And so the populations can get uh, quite large. Speaking of uh, predators, uh, other examples, and there's many uh, well-documented uh, examples, of uh, where uh, predators have actually been removed from a particular uh, ecosystem, either through uh, overhunting, um, as uh, was seen here in the Yellowstone area, where wolves were uh, extirpated, um, and in the uh, the consequence of that is that large ungulate uh, browsers like these uh, elk here are, were able to overconsume the not overconsumed, but they were able to uh, defoliate the, the uh, riparian vegetation and in fact um, uh, uh, limiting recruitment of things like poplars uh, along streams and so on. So the vegetation in these uh, environments where wolves were removed is completely different than one and where wolves are there and able to keep uh, elk under suppression. There's uh, uh, many other really well uh, documented examples of this in um, uh, in marine systems and, uh, uh, and, and other places. In agricultural systems, uh, you uh, have examples that look something like this, uh, something that's referred to as um, uh, pesticide resurgence. This is uh, an example, for example, with uh, the brown rice plant hopper, Nila pervada lugans. This is one of the most important uh, key pests of rice uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, rice being one of the most important staple crops for calories in the world, uh, actually. Uh, as these populations start to grow, uh, growers, uh, particularly in the 60s and 70s, uh, and even today to some extent, uh, resorted to broad-spectrum insecticides to control these, uh, these insects. What happens is these kill off not just the herbivores, but they also kill off the predators, like these generalist uh, spiders here. These spiders have longer generation times than the herbivores, uh, which means that the, the populations of these guys can rebound quite rapidly, causing uh, damage to the plants. Here you can see this classic, what's referred to as hopper burn. This is actually a, a plant reaction to the salivary uh, secretions and to the feeding of the, um, 
uh, of these uh, um, homopterans uh, on the on the plants, which completely shuts down the photosynthetic system and can cause significant uh, damage. And this can happen because there basically are no predators around. And the flip side of this uh, is instances like we learned uh, early on in class where predators have been reintroduced into a particular system, as is the case of classical biological control. And when this uh, predator-prey interaction is, is reestablished, you get the suppression of the herbivore and the lack of consumption of plants, and therefore a green world. So under uh, the analysis of Hairston, Smith, and Slobodkin, what they proposed was that the reason why we have lots of plants in the world has to do with the fact that herbivores, those things that consume, have these negative effects uh, on plants, are largely kept in check by the third trophic level in this very simple kind of food chain system. This is the first trophic level, primary producers. This is the second uh, trophic level, herbivores. And this is the third uh, trophic level, the predators, um, parasites, uh, parasitoids of these, of these herbivores. So this second trophic level is kept in check by the third trophic level, thereby releasing plants from, uh, from ex extensive uh, herbivory. Uh, this is exactly the situation of, um, of what we try to create um, in biological control, manipulating in some way the, uh, the natural enemies uh, so that we gain some benefit uh, from the plants. And they argued that this logic is pretty hard to refute, uh, that top-down control is actually what maintains the world green. Well, the remainder of this uh, particular lesson is really trying to uh, explore some alternatives uh, to this particular top-down hypothesis. Turns out, as you can imagine, plants are not sitting ducks, and plant-herbivore interactions have been evolving for millennia. So plants have evolved a variety of ways in which they protect themselves uh, from, um, from, pre from uh, herbivores and from the loss of this very hard-earned um, uh, tissue that they've put together. And the situation looks uh, something like this where plants have a variety of uh, traits, uh, you can call them defenses, but things that can act directly on the herbivore that either uh, constitute uh, uh, physical uh, properties of the plants that reduce uh, herbivory um, or chemical uh, defenses. In fact, this is an amazing uh, area and we're gonna learn much more about it. Uh, plants are incredible uh, chemists and they have a whole suite of uh, compounds that they create to, uh, that have negative effects uh, on herbivores. These uh, sometimes were, are referred to as the direct defenses, those things that act directly on the herbivores. But plants also have uh, figured out ways, um, you can call it that, that have traits uh, that, uh, that interact or have effects on the third trophic levels so that their activity is enhanced uh, and herbivores are maintained at, at, lower, at lower abundances. You could think of these as indirect offenses, things that facilitate the impact, traits of the plants that facilitate the impact of natural enemies on their herbivorous prey. And these are traits that can be selected upon um, that confer uh, fitness advantages uh, to the plants. And so we're gonna explore um, all of these in the next couple of lessons.